Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, to this um, edition of the, of the mini school. Today is the last lecture on the mini school uh, that introduces us uh, to, to, to category theory. And I don't need to introduce the two speakers uh, uh, again. Um, and um, I think we'll keep it short and sweet. You know how, it is, uh, how the rules are. Please use the Q&A for questions. And since we're not so many, we can uh, all raise your hand and we can give you the, the, the right to speak uh, uh, when the time is, is, is appropriate. Um, and um, without further ado, because I know probably it might be a, a longer session today, because it's the last one, uh, please, Amartya and Zurep, uh, it, it's your show. Everybody is very excited to, to learn more about category theory. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesco. Uh, it's our great pleasure to going through this very nice, uh, beautiful journey and interacting with people here. We are very, very excited and uh, we hope uh, many people will be getting interested or further inquire about the category theory with this one, like this one. Okay, so Zurab, uh, today is supposed to be the last lecture. Uh, I was just thinking, uh, may I tell you a crazy question which I came across when I first studied topology? That sounds interesting. Well, when I first was studying topology, uh, a, a very strange idea came to me that uh, what about if we have sets which changes with time in the sense that wait, wait. imagine in... Did you just... Sorry, sorry, to, did, sorry to interrupt. Did you just say a set that changes with time? Yes. Okay, I'm listening. Uh, yeah, so for example, imagine that at... Uh, okay. What is this here? Say at time t equal to one, then our set has a, say three elements, three, five, six. And at time t equal to two, the set has four elements. So we are changing the set with time. Okay. And if, if, so the, the idea is that if we are, uh, we are changing the sets with respect to time, and if we do some kind of ordering of the time on the left hand side and uh, change the sets with respect to time. So do you think that this idea can be conceptualized and uh, formalized and hence can be uh, connected with this concept of category theory and give some nice uh, representation of it? That look, sounds very um, interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm trying to make a picture from, from what you suggested. Mm -hmm. um, so for each instance of time, let's say one, two, or three, right. or maybe even, even a half, right? Yeah, we can make it half, yes, yes, sure. Uh, for each instance of time, we have um, the picture of how that set looks like at that point in time, right? Right, right. Um, and so your idea is that this is a, a kind of um, uh, evolving so, set. Yes, yes, something evolving set with respect to, say, time parameter. Mm -hmm. But you probably want to have some kind of uh, interaction between um, the two sets um, um, captured, uh, I mean, the same set captured at two different instances. Of yes, time yes, 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 definitely, definitely. Um, definitely. So your, uh, your S1 was, uh, had only three elements, three, uh, mm. five, five and six. And, and six. And your S2 had um, three, five, um, seven, and six. Right. And um, as we transition from time one to time two, the new element seven has been added, but the right. others have been kept. And, and somehow to, to capture the information of which elements from S1 correspond to which elements of S2. I mean, we might not even call this three anymore. We might call it something else maybe. Mm -hmm. To capture that information, one way of capturing that information would be uh, to have a function that, uh, that keeps a record of which Keep uh, elements record. from... Yeah from set being uh, um, 
identified at time one um, is corresponds to the, the same element, but now uh, that, that element uh, obtained at a different point in time. And maybe yeah. it could also be that um, uh, maybe two things that we thought at time two were actually different elements turn out to be the same element when we have a more careful measurement of the set, maybe at time three, right? Hmm. But if we want these um, transition mappings to be functions, then we will never have an opportunity of um, getting rid of an element. So we will have to always keep, so nothing can disappear. Things, more things nothing can appear, can. but nothing can disappear. Yes. And I would suggest that we work with this model because we have defined the category of sets so that mm -hmm. this picture, this entire picture would be living inside the category of sets. Same, same. But if we, if we wanted also to allow um, some sets to, some elements to disappear uh, as time goes by, then we would have needed our uh, arrows between, uh, between sets to be not just functions, but more generally relations. And we haven't looked mm -hmm. at that category yet. So maybe we don't look at it here either. Yeah. So what I'm seeing here, uh, Amorto, is um, I, I think I'm seeing here some some sort of functor where you mean from uh, this the time category to these moving sets, or what do you say? No, uh, the, 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 the time category is no longer the time category in the sense we defined it before. So I want before, to set up right. two categories where this one is still the category of sets, like when we were talking about dynamical systems, hmm. but but here it's it's a different kind of time category where this time uh, the 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 time instances are the objects of the category, right? And um, um, well, I think my my one and a half, uh, my half is positioned in the wrong spot. It should it would have been three over two if, if it's supposed to be between um, one and two, right? Yeah. Sorry, yes. Sorry yes. about it, but yeah. So. Uh, objects are uh, instances of time and mm -hmm. arrows are uh, just the relationship of one uh, being less than the other. So it, yeah. it tells us that one is less than the other. And this one tells us that the other is less than the third and so on. Yeah. And of course, when we have such a setup, it, we easily get a category because composition would be just transitivity of the less or equal relation, right? From one to two. And, and the identity arrows would be guaranteed by the fact that every number is less than itself, that less or equal mm. to itself. So, um, if we have these two categories where this is like the modified time category, so to distinguish mm -hmm. it from, from the one we discussed before, then I think your idea of uh, uh, evolving set could be represented as a functor um, from the modified time category to the category of sets. So what the functor will do, it will map uh, each instance of time to the version of the set that, that was obtained at that point in time. So one will be mapped to S1, uh, three over two will be mapped to S3 over 2. S3 over 2. Mm -hmm. 2 will be mapped to uh, S2 and so on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, it would be interesting to see what would the meaning of uh, the axioms on a functor be, so the functor reality idea. And before even discussing the functor reality, uh, a functor should say what happens to objects, right? Yeah. As yes. well as what happens to arrows. Uh, yes. And so we, we now said that for, for a, a time instance T, um, the functor maps that time instance to the, the version of the set at that time instance, right? Hmm. Um, but we haven't said yet what, uh, what the um, effect of the functor is on arrows. So if on I have yes. one time instance being less or equal to another time instance, T prime, then I, I need to have now an arrow from st to st prime st prime and maybe that arrow should be exactly uh, these functions we were talking about here uh, the ones that keep track of which elements from the previous set from the previous mm -hmm. picture of the set 
which elements mm. correspond to the uh, elements in the new picture of the same set I mean, the, the the set that has now evolved but uh, some elements uh, have interpretation mm -hmm. from the previous one to the new set. Well, actually all elements do because we want those things to be functions. Um, and, and maybe we can call this, this thing, we can call S subscript TT prime. And so in this example here, S12 will be that function that we, we drew here and S23 uh, will be that other function we drew there. So this describes the functor in terms of its effect on objects and arrows. So um, that's how it affects on objects. This is how it affects on arrows. But now yeah. we have to check that uh, uh, this thing is a functor and then we have to kind of see if it's meaningful to think of this as a functor in terms of satisfying the conditions that the functor should satisfy. Mm -hmm. So the, the first condition that the functor should satisfy is that if, uh, we have a special arrow, so this looping arrow in the modified time category. So this would be just the fact that time t is less or equal to itself. Um, then the corresponding arrow in the category of sets should be um, the special arrow of the category of sets, which means the identity arrow that maps every element x to itself. Yeah, you mean st on the other side. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. And does that make sense? So if I if I measure mm -hmm. my set at time t, and if I at time t I, I have an experiment that kind of looks into my set, and I notice what its contents is, and that maybe somebody else, but at the same time, mm -hmm. <laughs> makes the experiment, um, then the way uh, elements of my set will correspond to the elements of the other set is that they should simply be identical because if, if the measurement took place at the same time, then the result of the measurement should be the same. Mm. So X, uh, X measured in, the, in this uh, um, uh, version of the set should, 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 should be the same X measured in the, in, the, in the other version, which is the same version because it's the same time. So it, it kind of makes sense this first axiom of the functor, right? Yeah. So and, basically, and, at this stage, at this yeah. stage, we can think. Uh, I mean, uh, just an idea that, from a practical point of view, we can think these uh, evolving sets as a measurements information or the data which obtained in different times, which is evolving with respect to time. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're actually right. Sorry, I'm, I kind of started talking about measurement without any introduction to that. So, so thanks for that point. Yeah, so that could mm -hmm. be a way of thinking about it. Um, and uh, now the second axiom of the functor, uh, which says that it must preserve compositions. In our case, right. we say that if I'm um, considering three instances of my of my set uh, at three different time inst instances, right? T1, T2, T3, which are ordered the way shown in this picture, then the corresponding functions we get here, uh, S T1 comma T2 and S T2 comma T3, T3. Um, when I compose them, right, I should get the same result as the uh, correspondence function for the time um, transition from T1 to T3. So S T1 comma T3. T3. And that kind of also makes sense, right? Because, um, I mean, if I look at this picture, if I... Um, uh, let's let's take number three. So uh, there is this element in my set at time instance one, mm -hmm. and when I move to time instance two, uh, three is retained to be three in that other set S two. When I move after that, when I move to time instance three, three uh, then corresponds to that element in this new version of the set. But if I had directly gone from S one to S three. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is composing these two functions, that that should be that should have the same effect. Mm. Um, so that's telling me that that the composite here of those two should equal to s one three. So I think the axioms of a functor very naturally fit into this example. Fits with this, yeah. So we can no, then say that evolving set is a functor from the modified mm. time category to the category of sets. 
So I think your idea makes perfect sense. And I guess the, the audience uh, probably by now uh, has figured that a lot of times when we ask each other questions and we give answers, these are not really new questions. We kind of pretend these to be new questions. But I think in your case, Amorto, as far as I remember, you actually discovered this idea of evolving set even before you, you knew that it existed, right? You want to tell yes, me yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was very strange that when I first started learning uh, topology in Indi back in India, and I have a, this crazy idea because if, to me, everything is a statics that we have either a Hofstra space or a connected space or a compact space. Then I, I, I was thinking that what about if the sets changes with the respect to time that uh, the, we have more elements in the set, the distance that they change, if their behavior change with respect to time. And uh, can you represent such a concept in a more concrete way? And uh, what we are, uh, at that time, of course, I couldn't figure it out uh, that time, but the question was quite long time ago, which came to me like this form. And uh, now we today see it's actually a very nice uh, example of a functor from this specific type of uh, special type of time category with this uh, extra property to this so called evolving set. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, did you ask anyone about this? I mean, did you ask any of your lecturers about this? Uh, yes, I asked. And uh, I mean, it, it, I mean, this kind of question generally doesn't appear in neither in general topology or not even in algebraic topology, like where your uh, setup changes with respect to time. And uh, of course, I didn't get a satisfactory answer or rather no answers at that time. And, but very recently, it came to my mind that it's actually related to a very deep theory. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a pleasant experience after all these years to come up with a question which has some significance value with respect to some concept in mathematics. So now I have a question. Um, and maybe this is something that we could ask the audience as well. Mm, so oh, yeah, sure. if if we've now introduced this idea of evolving set, right, which is supposed to be a set that could change over time. Um, I mean, one of the first things we do with sets in mathematics, and that's something also one of the first things we did here in, in the mini course, was to define a function between them, because then we made a category of sets using that notion of a function. But now I'm wondering, uh, what would be, um, uh, what would be a notion of a function between evolving sets. Between two evolving sets, yes. Yes. Mm. So, so yeah, given, the, the, mm. given evolving sets uh, f, and let's call them f and g now because they are functors, um, how to define, how to define a function um, or maybe let, let's not call it a function anymore because these are not sets anymore. So let's call it something else, maybe like, or you know what, let, let's call it a function. We can rename it afterwards, perhaps when we have, um, uh, when we come up with the definition. Um, how to define a function from F to G? Uh, we need to help our audience by F and G. We wanted to mean F is this whole picture of this uh, three sets thing and then similar another G. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, drawing this on a picture would be, would be quite a bizarre thing to do because, mm -hmm. so we, we now have this uh, uh, modified time category, let me just call it MTC like that. And yeah. then we have the category of sets and um, an evolving set is a functor uh, from there to there. And now we have two of them. So we have these arrows, F and G, right? Going from empty C to set. And now we're kind of asking um, to define an arrow between arrows, you see. Right. Yeah, that's a very interesting question as well as we need to know the answer of this question to proceed further and get a better picture of this event. Mm. So shall we shall we try to get some input from the audience if they have some? Yes, ideas yes, yes, definitely, definitely. 
So would anyone like to, to try to answer um, the question of how to define a function between evolving sets? So let me just remind, uh, while, while uh, everybody is thinking, let me just remind you what a function is between two sets. So if you have two sets, two static sets, a function, what it does, it assigns to every element in one set, every, every member of one set, it assigns to a, a member of the other set. This doesn't have to be one-to-one -one assignment, um, but it must exhaust all the things in the domain and it can leave some things unassigned of the, of the code. Yes, so, something, something uh, unassigned on the other side of the mm. So, so would anyone like to um, propose an answer to this question of what is a function between evolving sets? Uh, if participants want to raise their hand to make it easier to express thoughts, please do so, and, and I will give you the right to speak. I think we, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Malatze raised his hand, or, or Ms. Malatze, I'm not sure. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you, please. Um, I, I'm not sure though, but then wouldn't this be a generalized notion of a homotopy because of now we're dealing with uh, categories and they are much more general than, for instance, um, topological spaces or things like that. So I'm thinking the function that's supposed to change the functor from F to G might be something of a generalized homotopy of, of some sort. Uh, that's a good remark. This picture that we drew here, uh, arrow between arrows, that kind of suggests that this we would get something that's very analogous to the idea of homotopy in topology where you have, um, where you relate to continuous maps via the notion called homotopy. So that also is an error between errors. Um, in fact, you're quite right. Uh, the concept we will arrive to uh, after this investigation will be a concept that's kind of parallel to the notion of homotopy in topology. But I don't think that analogy helps us to concretize in this case, exactly how this thing should be defined for this specific scenario of evolving sets, unless you have some ideas around that. Okay, let me just think. Sorry, meanwhile, there is a suggestion from one of the listeners. Yeah, the from the question and sir, yes. Can't we find like an inverse of F which would relate the codomain of F to the domain of G? But if and G are not uh, inverse of each other. No, so, uh, uh, they're not inverses, but what she's asking is if we can maybe reverse this process. Um, well, I doubt it because uh, we could perhaps like, at least for those things which, which come from the modified time category, those sets we could send them back. But, but even then, even so, we might not be able to do that because what if sometimes these two turn out to be equal to each other but on the other side, the corresponding time instances were, were not equal to each other. Then, uh, so I don't think it's possible to to find a reasonable notion of inverse uh, of f. Okay, there is another question. Okay, sure. Any other suggestion from the audience? So, does anyone have an idea how we could? Maybe uh, it would be useful if we kind of draw pictures for each of those evolving sets. Um, something similar to the previous picture, but with a bit more ingredient now showing both sets. So let's say we, we, we let's just take like uh, two timestamps here, um, F1 and F2. So F is an evolving set that at time um, one, it, it has some elements. 
And at time two, it has some other elements. And those elements are related by some uh, time transition um, function. And then we have another uh, evolving set G. Um, which once again for the same, um, uh, for, but it's now given for the same time um, uh, instances and uh, G has some other uh, elements in it. And um, again, there is a transition of time function here. So of course this function is nothing other than F of um, the, the way we denoted, what we denoted by F of one, two before. We had S in the place of F before, right? And so here we have a function G12. And if I just had, in, in this situation, if I just had a single static set, right? If I was just working with one set here and another set here, then a function is what, what is shown there, right? The function would have been just a way of mapping um, these uh, members of, of the first set to, to these members of the second set. For example, set. this could have mapped uh, here and those two could have mapped, maybe mapped there, right? So that would be an example of a function between the static sets F1 and, and G1. But now our set is evolving and somehow we should take that into account when we try to define a function of evolving sets. Does anyone have any ideas what to do, how to, how to come up with such a notion? In, in category theory, there is a lot of times when we want to um, before working with some, some specific phenomenon, we want to translate that and formalize that in the, in the language of, um, or in the mathematical language. And, and so in this case, once we have this idea of evolving set, naturally the thought comes that there should be a corresponding notion of a function. So we're trying to now develop a definition basically. And uh, it can take a while uh, for developing definitions in mathematics. And, and sometimes it could be an extreme extremely tough challenge, not, not less tough than uh, solving a, a, an open problem. Um, uh, but maybe um, maybe we can nevertheless uh, overcome this obstacle and, and come up with a, a nice notion of evolving function. That, okay, yeah, uh, another, yeah, so Maya have another. So should we have functions from F1 to G1, F2 to G2, and from each uh -huh. arrow in F to arrows in G? That's a that's an interesting that's a very good idea actually. Um, so I think what Sumaya is telling us is that we should have a function from f1 to g1 as if they are static sets because at that point in time they are static sets. Yes, yeah, same thing. But then we also should have a function from f2 to g2. So every time we freeze time, we need to have a function between the corresponding sets. That's right. I think I, I need to also map this element there. Um, and so this we will have for each um, time instance, right? So there will be um, a, a, whole, a whole family of functions, one for each, uh, let's, let's call these things alpha, um, or maybe uh, uh, sigma, uh, in giving credit to, to Samaya's idea. Uh, so sigma one, Sigma two. Um, but now uh, the, the question is whether um, this data of, of functions between corresponding instances of, of, of the sets, right? Of the evolving sets, whether they should in, in, in any way interact with um, the, uh, the functions that describe transitions between the sets uh, from one time to another. What do you think, Amorto? Yeah, that need to be interacting, otherwise it will not make sense. Like for example, if I, um, um, let's say I pick um, this element here. And yeah. um, at time one, uh, the function maps that element to to this element here. So let's, let's give a name to this thing. So it maps X to, to y. Now, uh, when time has elapsed from one to two, now we have time two, 
we now recognize this y element to be that y prime element over there. So y prime is, is, is this element over here. So that's my y prime. So, so what we did now, we, we mapped x to y, and then some time has passed, and now we are observing that y, but now in that time too, y it, it obtains the form of y prime. Um, should this somehow correlate with first waiting for time to pass in the evolving set f, so that then this x would, would map there, and then uh, applying the function to that, because the, the idea is that this x prime, wherever x maps to, is kind of should kind of represent the same object as f, x. It's just that it was, it was measured at a different point in time, right? It was identified at a different point in time. But now that function uh, will be mapping this x prime to an element here. Um, let's call this y double prime. And so we get a scenario where the value of our function, the value of sigma, right, depends on when we evaluate the function. Right. If, if we evaluate the function at time one, right, then x maps to y. And when time has passed and now we're at time two, that y is now y prime. But if I evaluate the function at time two, then the value is y double prime. And that's different from y prime. Right. And so it, it, it kind of seems to mean that uh, the value of my function now depends at which time am I, am I going to be evaluating the function, right? And right. maybe we don't want that. Maybe we want. Um, they should be same. Uh, yeah, maybe we want some kind of coherence where mm -hmm. it doesn't matter when we when we apply the function that somehow um, the result of applying the function is invariant of when we are measuring uh, when measuring we are actually measure. carrying out that or measuring uh, the value of the of the function element. Um, so uh, let's make a kind of a vote. So uh, if you think that it's, it's wrong for y double prime to be different from y prime, so it's wrong for, for measuring the values of the function to depend on which time instance we're looking at, raise your hand, please. So everybody who thinks that it's, it's kind of odd that uh, these are different, that they should, shouldn't have been different values, Please raise your hand. Shouldn't have. So everybody who thinks that y prime should have actually been equal to y double prime here. Yeah. If you think they should have equal to each other, uh, raise your hand, please. One, okay, so we have one hand. Two, two three, three, four, five. Four, five. Out of 26, five people think that they should be same. Yeah. Now, if you think that they shouldn't be the same, if you think that um, deciding what the value of the function is should depend on time, please raise your hand. Oh, only Sumaya. Only one. No, she even she no. lowered her hand. Okay, uh, so Maya, did you lower your hand or do you already support the other hand, one? Marta. Okay. No, um, no, she first raised her hand. So, um, uh, but I'm wondering now, did we lose the rest of the 20 uh, <laughs> members of the audience? Uh, so perhaps uh, if you have any questions on what topic we're discussing, if there's something unclear in what we're talking about, could you maybe ask your question before we proceed? Okay, the, the, nobody's asking anything, so maybe we can proceed in that case. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what do you think, Amorto? Should should I mean, according to the majority of, of vote, right? So, we actually want this uh, y prime. We want it to be equal to y double prime, and that condition, uh, so in, invariance of the function under uh, the time when we are evaluating the function, that condition is. Um, is something very meaningful, which um, 
can be generalized to arbitrary to functors uh, to give a notion of uh, what is called a natural transformation between functors. Um, so let's abstract away uh, for, a, for a bit now from this specific picture. And let's think of, um, let's think of these two categories as two arbitrary categories. So we have, uh, let's say category C and category D, and we have two functions between them, F and G. And we are, we're now going to define something that's called uh, a natural transformation from F to G. So uh, Zurab, you were suggesting, you were saying that uh, if Y prime equal to become Y double prime, I mean, if you support that that uh, kind of notion, then that leads to the notion of natural transformation. That's right, yeah. Uh -huh. right. So a natural transformation from F to G um, is given by a system of arrows in D. So there will be one arrow, uh, we're going to continue calling it sigma. There will be one arrow for each object of, of C. And that arrow will be an arrow from, and maybe to kind of uh, keep this thing um, closely related in terms of notation to what we we're discussing before, so it's easier to see the link between the two. I'm going to use uh, small t yes. as an object for C. So t represents an object in C. Um, um, I'm not going to write anything down, but so for each object t in C, we'll have. Um, an arrow from f of t to g of t. Um, Which is nothing but an arrow in the category of d. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So t is an object in c, then f t is an object in d. Similarly, g t is an object in d, and then f t to g t become an arrow in the category of d. Yeah. So if, if we like have uh, two objects, uh, t1 and t2 in c, on the C side, um, then um, uh, we could apply the function F to uh, the functor F. We have two functors, right? F and G. So we could apply uh, the functor F to T1. And we could also apply um, the functor. Maybe I should um, draw this in a slightly different way. Let me put it, put it horizontally. So I could apply the functor F or I could apply the functor G to T1. Um, and every time I, I fix an object on the left-hand side category and, and I apply those functors, I need to have a specified arrow, uh, sigma T uh, from F of T1 to G of T. So intuitively, I mean, in terms of the previous example, our F of T is, if, if F is the uh, evolving set, F of T1 mm -hmm. is the picture of that set at time T1. And, and uh, G of T1 is the picture of the different evolving set G at the same time T1. And, and this is uh, a function between those uh, pictures, um, which if they were static uh, sets, they would just be an ordinary function. But now uh, if I have, um, uh, I mean, what we considered here in the previous situation was an arrow between, um, I mean, this was this one comma two here, right? This was an arrow from, from time instance one to time instance two. So if I have an arrow from T1 to T2, um, let's call this arrow something. Um, let's call this arrow um, A, right? If I have an arrow A from T1 to T2, that gives me a transition from F of T1 to F of T2 through F of A, yeah? Right. Um, and it gives me transition from G of T1 to G of T2 through G of A. But now once I transitioned, uh, the, the same um, uh, sigma now defines an arrow between those uh, uh, versions of the F and the G, the ones that are measured at time T2 and time, yeah, 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 yeah. time T2 in both cases, right? So this would be sigma T2, whereas the, the other one was sigma T1. T1. And what we're asking now is that if I have uh, some element here, some object here in, inside f of t1, I mean, pre pretend this is still in the same example we were considering, 
uh, and basically maybe actually the better way of relating this to the other picture is to, to give corresponding labels. So let me see if I can zoom this out. Um, so we can start with X. So in the previous picture, uh, F of T1 um, corresponds to this F1. So this is our F of T1. F of T1. And F2 corresponds to F of T2. Um, G1 is G of T1. G of, G, G of T1 and then it's G of T2. That's right, yeah. And, and this uh, F12 is nothing other, so we have an arrow from here to there, which is F12, which is our F of A. Uh, so F of A is what we had before, F of one, F12. And uh, this G12 is our G of uh, A. And now what we, uh, what we required in this diagram for Y prime and Y double prime to coincide, that meant that uh, if I begin with some object X, right, inside F1, I apply the function, I apply this FA function to move to that set, right? Okay. And then I apply the sigma two function to move to this set. I wanted this Y double prime, which is the result of this composing these two functions. I wanted that to be the same as first carrying x to, to g1 by applying the sigma 1 function, and then carrying that further to uh, g2 by applying it to ga function. So I, I basically mm -hmm. want the composite of, of these functions to be uh, equal, right? So if, okay. if sigma 2 now um, corresponds to my sigma t2, and sigma 1 corresponds to sigma t1, what I really want is that um, the composite of sigma t2 sigma t2 composed with so so this function composed with f uh, of a equal, equal uh, g, of g of a, a composed sigma with t1. sigma t1 right and now this equality can be um, stated not just for this specific example of evolving sets, but also for a, a setup where we, we have a general, two general functors, uh, two arbitrary functors between two arbitrary categories, uh, F and G. And we have the system of uh, arrows uh, specified for each T, so an arrow from FT to GT. And then uh, we ask that for any uh, T, for every T, uh, and for every T1 actually, and for every T2, and for every A, which are objects and arrows in the category C, um, we have this condition that these composites are equal. So when that holds, and, yeah. we call the system as a natural transformation. And this type of diagram, whenever we start from X, going to X dash, or x prime and then going to something there. And if we start from x and going to y and y back to that, and if y prime and y are same, uh, this type of diagram has some specific name, right? Yeah, you mean a commutative diagram? Yeah, that's, that's called commutative diagram whenever it happens for all such objects. Right. It is indeed, yes. So we arrive to the uh, this way. We arrive to the third um, piece of, of of our plan. Uh, 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 Zura, I think. Yeah? Uh, sorry, Zura, I think Joseph has a uh, raised his hands. Uh, yes, yes, please, Joseph. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, do you hear me? Yes. 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 Please. Yes. Um, yes. It's very interesting. The naturality of this transformation depends on the difference between the functors f and g. Yes, of course, if f g is equal to f, then it's trivial. Uh, so can one describe how somehow how this difference must be so that this is an interesting point? 
or do you have another very in, very very simple uh, example for this natural transformation in some uh, structure? Uh, thank you, Yosef. I'm going to um, uh, we'll, we'll answer it in, in, the, in the sequence. So if F and G were not different, but actually were the same object, it still doesn't mean that natural transformation is to be trivial because we can have the same object, like this could have been the same object X, but the function might need not have been identity function. It could still be uh, uh, some, some endomorphism of X, which is not necessarily identity map. Uh -huh. uh, so coincidence of F and G is not uh, enough for, for the transformation to be trivial. So that's one point. Um, the other point is that, uh, yes, indeed, that's a, a nice way of thinking about it, that, that the natural transformation measures the difference. And um, I think you were asking about um, what should be the, the properties of, of this idea be. And the, the property is exactly this, which says that if I measure difference at object T1 and I measure difference at object T2, these differences should be compatible with each other in respect of transitioning from T1 to T2 by an error in C. That's oh, exactly yeah. what oh. this axiom represents. So it's not just arbitrary differences, but the ones that are compatible to errors that come from C. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in terms of uh, a different example, uh, a structural example, for, for instance, uh, there are uh, enormous amount of them. Um, uh, perhaps uh, one nice example would be uh, determinant. What do you think, Amarto? Yes, determinant is a very nice example. We can associate two functors. One that we can do take. Uh, Maybe look, first we define what the categories are. So we could consider yeah. the category of rings. Rings. And the category of groups. Mm -hmm. Groups. And we could assign to every ring. This thing all, called PL. Uh, all in my in invertible matrices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that could be one functor F that does that. And that is we can associate all the invertible elements of the ring. Right. Uh, so ring. Uh, um, we generally use right U R capital U R or. Uh, uh, yeah, you, please write that. I don't know how. What is the standard notation for that? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, just a second. Uh, my writing board behaves different today. You are. Uh, yes, you are. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I can. I can yes. do that. You are. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so this functor would be called U. So instead of G, we now have U. Uh -huh. So yeah. this is just the invertible elements in in uh, in the ring, right? Right. So maybe then we instead of F, we write it GLN just to follow the same notation to have the similarity. Right. That's a good idea. Yeah. So this functor is GLN functor, and the other right. one is U functor. Uh huh. And, and we can then the yeah. Then so the determinant will be um, yes. Map, that's right. Yeah. Right. But uh -huh. but we have determinant map for every ring. Now what happens if I have two rings? And yeah. I consider the corresponding determinant map for uh, GLN uh, mapping from GLN S to US. Right. Um, so that's the, again the GLN functor. And the other one is the, the same U functor. But now, right. what if I consider a ring homomorphism here? That will certainly give rise to a homomorphism between matrices, right? Right. Um, just uh, take a matrix and apply the, your homomorphism to every entry of the matrix. Right. And invertible elements uh, are mapped to invertible elements by ring homomorphism. So we also have right. a thing here. Right. Um, and uh, now naturality of this determinant map. So we have a system of maps here given by determinants, one for each uh, ring R. Uh, so this is object in um, the category of rings. Uh, and naturality says that if I take my determinant, sorry, if I take a matrix, uh, I uh, apply my function to each entry of the matrix, right. and then and then compute the determinant. So I do 
that um, S uh, composed with GL and F. So I go around the diagram this way. So that applied to a matrix M. Um, that should give me the same result as first computing the determinant of, of the matrix. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then um, uh, evaluating that value by the function UF. And that's of course because uh, uh, determinant, the, the computation of determinant is in terms of addition and multiplication of the ring and F uh, preserved them. So, it, so that's why it works like that. So would this be a good example of what you were looking for yourself? Yes, 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 I, uh, I grasp the point, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Yorick. In the changing set example, the sigma t seems similar to the example of dynamical systems. Is there a category with sigma t as objects? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the transition with dynamical systems is actually very, very interesting. So um, this modified time category um, uh, has actually a functor to the usual time category. We're not going to go in details now, but we're going to post the details in the blog. Uh, there is a functor from modified time category to the time category the way we de defined it. A dynamical system was a functor from the time category to the category of sets. And if we compose these two functors, we get a functor there. So there is a canonical way of turning every evolving set into a dynamical system by the composite of these two functors. And uh, it's a fun thing to play with, um, to, to compare these two things and so on. And it, 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 moreover, it turns out that the, the modified time category can actually be constructed from the time category using a general categorical construction, but we're not going to go into detail into that, but it's an interesting question, Yorick. Thank you for that. Uh, Partha wrote a remark here, elements of a set as functions from singleton, pairs of elements of a set as functions from two elements. Uh, Partha, uh, will you please elaborate uh, which point you are trying to explain? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so just to just to say once again, so this thing we, we're going to explain a bit more in, in the in the blog, um, uh, and uh, now let me see Bartos' uh, question. Um, no, no, I was trying no, to give. Question. Yeah, yeah, please, Bartos. I, I was trying to give uh, more natural examples of natural transformations. So, picking elements from a set or pairs of elements from a set are all are natural transformations. Yeah, so whenever you, whenever you have some kind of function generic... defined for every structure, right? Mm. And if this function is constructed in some canonical way, mm. then usually it ends up being a natural transformation. Mm. Like here, the determinant function um, was a function that can be defined for every ring. And um, it's natural in the sense that um, it's defined by some formula, basically. <laughs> that's how it's, uh, that's, that, it's not just some ad hoc crazy function, but it's actually defined by some meaningful formula. Um, and, and that is the reason why it turns out to be natural transformation. So this, that's general philosophy. But, but, but maybe you wanted to say something more specific, Parker? No, exactly, exactly. When things are defined in a canonical way, it doesn't depend in any way on the specifics of the mm. Uh, mm. properties of the set, it turns out to be natural. Yes, so just exactly. as another example, maybe it's not a, a, as easy example, but so for example, if I, if I start to look at all the possible errors from tensor product of two, um, maybe vector spaces or abelian groups or um, other types of spaces, uh, so, so this represents all the um, uh, morphisms from A tensor B to C. That turns out to be bijective. Um, to, so we have a bijection from this set to the set of all the arrows from B to C to the power A, where this is the, um, the vector space of all functions from, of linear maps from A to C. Um, and um, so basically bilinear maps, I mean, these kinds of things are called bilinear maps, right? And so they can be 
classified in terms of linear maps from B to, to the uh, vector space of uh, functions. And so this, this is another example of something that's natural in the sense that if I now start changing my A, B, and C with other vector spaces uh, through some linear maps, then the bijection uh, will stay, uh, will, will keep satisfying that, that diagram, I mean, that, this kind of condition. Um, so to represent it as a natural transformation between functors, we would have to consider functors of three variables, um, which means take Cartesian product of the category of vector spaces three times. Let's say we are working over reals. We will have two functors there, one um, assigning to, um, well, this could have actually been also still vector spaces here. One assigning um, to every triple of vector spaces A, B, C. Uh, this uh, set, this vector space, and the other assigning to every triple A, B, C, um, that vector space. And uh, th there will be isomorphism here of. Um, Vector space. I hope I'm not talking nonsense. Uh, there will be isomorphism of these vector spaces here, and it will be natural in the in the same sense that we described before. So any kind of construction, uh, any kind of way of producing some kind of uh, arrow between two things constructed out of structures, um, if if this method is kind of canonical in some sense, it ends up being a natural transformation. And in fact, the very first uh, paper on category theory by Saunders, McLean, and Samuel Edelberg, um, uh, in the paper, they explained that the, the fundamental concept they want to propose is that of a natural transformation and more specifically natural isomorphism. That's a situation where this transformation happens to be moreover, not just a function, but, but a bijective function that preserves the structure and so on. And so to define what a natural transformation is, they had to formalize what, what a functor would be. And to define what a functor is, they had to formalize what a category would be. So in some sense, natural transformations are kind of the heart of the story of how category theory was born. Um, uh, yeah. Yonik made a very important remark, which we did mention that our link need to be committed given that example of a determinant as a natural transformation. Yeah, yeah. That's true, yeah. Thank you. Thank it's you, the category of commutative rings here, not yeah. just arbitrary rings. Yes. And, uh, and, and, yeah, when, yeah. and when we are, sorry to interrupt, it was just yeah. another remark. When we are working with the uh, with the matrices, we think of it as a group under multiplication, of course, and not yeah, under right, addition. Right. Yeah. Not addition. Uh, since we are almost finishing uh, our time, in fact, maybe we can, uh, open the floor to our audience for uh, any type of general remarks or questions uh, based on the materials what we discussed in these four lectures, Zura. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, let's do that. Yeah, please uh, feel free to uh, re uh, give review remarks, your opinion or questions about the materials, what we so far presented. Uh, of course, we have a very shortage of short, it, short time and, uh, to cover this whole subject, but uh, please feel free to ask questions or make your remarks. Yes, Andrew. Uh, I quickly give, uh, ah, here we go. Thank you, Ilya. Thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to ask if you could maybe give us some examples of categories in which the morphisms are not functions mm -hmm. um, just just a you know just a few remarks on 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 that thanks uh, thanks Thank Andrew, for, yeah. for that question so um, uh, a function is a special type of relation a, a relation between two sets is uh, a way of uh, assigning elements in one set to elements in the other set, but there are no rules, you can do anything. So the same thing could map to two different points and you could leave some of them unmapped and so on. So that's what a, a, a relation is. And uh, one can compose relations because if you have two assignments like this, then um, uh, 
uh, to pictures like that, that you can trace the picture along from, from the left side to the right side. So you take this element, you see what it's related to, and then you, you map it accordingly. And, um, and so I'm just drawing with the blue arrows the result of the composition of uh, the specific two relations. So we get a category, we get a category of relations. Uh, and so this is a, one example of a category where arrows are not functions. Um, also, I think we mentioned something about in the first lecture, division of numbers and... Uh, yeah, and then there are many other examples where yeah. the, the arrows are some kind of relationships. I mean, any, any transitive and reflexive relation will give rise to a category. So for example, any lattice in the sense of uh, lattice theory, um, not, not in the sense of uh, classical mathematical language where lattices points on, 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 on the plane, for instance, but um, a, a reflexive and transitive relation that admits meets and joins um, is automatically a category, but it's something I think Andrew already knows about. Uh, but I, just, I also want to make another remark, um, namely that um, although we can produce lots of examples of categories where errors are not necessarily functions, it turns out that uh, you can have a, a way of embedding uh, your category, in fact, in, inside the category of sets, as long as your category is not too large from the point of view of set theoretic consideration. So you can really think of any category as actually made out of arrows being functions, but then we don't keep all the functions, we, we, we need yeah. some of them. And it gives a very interesting philosophical point where take something as complicated as vector spaces, for instance, right? You, you, what, what do you have there? You have a, a set with some extra information of, of structure, your addition of vectors and so on and so forth. Um, so you have set with something more, and then you define linear maps between them. But you can also think of a vector space as just a, just a set, nothing more. And instead of adding more structure to your sets, remove some of your functions. So take sets and delete some functions to the valid arrows, then you will end up with the category of vector spaces. So it's a very philosophical and counterintuitive idea that in some sense, we can always represent our category as living inside a bigger one where arrows are functions. Um, and this representation I told you about here is the one that was uh, included in, uh, in the very first paper of category theory. It doesn't have very nice properties. There is a better representation where we uh, represent our category C as living inside the category of functors from C of the set, which we now know how the arrows will be defined there. There will be natural transformations. And this representation is called Yoneda embedding uh, because of Japanese mathematician who, who uh, uh, emphasized its importance and um, uh, it's one of the standard uh, embeddings in, in category theory. And uh, another thing I would like to say here is that these, these things are kind of almost like evolving sets, but, uh, but uh, the, time, the modified time category has been now replaced with my original category with the arrows reversed. This is what COP represents. I'm trying to kind of put in a, in a short space of time a lot of ideas here. Um, um, so uh, in a way, we can really think of any category as nicely uh, living inside um, some form of uh, category of generalized evolving sets. Um, so it, it's a bit of a philosophical point, but it also has lots of practical uses because when in, in order to work in this, some bizarre category that you might want to work in, uh, this embedding allows you to, it, it's a kind of representation theorem in category theory. It allows you to work with the abstract objects here as if there were some very specific type of thing like, like an evolving set. So, so in some sense, the answer, Andrew, is no. But in some sense, arrows can always be thought of as functions, at least. But at the same time, there are very lots of concrete categories where explicitly the arrows are not functions, like, for instance, the category of relations. Yeah. Uh, Parto asks a more generic question. Does category theory help us to compare and co contrast structures? We say, we say theory helps to understand individual structures. 
sorry, where is that question? Uh, it's in the chat. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think it, that's one of the main purpose of doing category theory to compare and contrast. Yeah, uh, the structures. For that are, are the notions of functional and natural transformation. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just, before we finish off, I want to uh, add um, a comment. So there was a question by. Um, uh, by um, uh, Professor uh, Honorkamp uh, the other day uh, about uh, a functor um, whose domain is uh, vector space seen as a category. So it was a very interesting question. It, it got us a bit, it got me a bit puzzled uh, because it was something new for me and I couldn't figure out something there. But anyway, we, we figured it out afterwards and together with Sumaya and, and Luke, two, two students at Stellenbosch University, we recorded the video uh, answering uh, that question of um, Professor Honorkamp. Uh, and if you'd like to see that, you're welcome to do that. That's, that's uh, the, the video is posted on the blog um, uh, with the uh, content of the um, third lecture, and which is, uh, and the address of the blog is, is this one here, in case you haven't seen that yet. Um, and before uh, uh, Professor Petriciana takes over and closes the session, I would like to enormously uh, thank him for the opportunity. Uh, uh, it was a very interesting experience and very, uh, uh, very interesting to, to, to communicate this subject to, to the audience, uh, to more, more general audience than, than I personally ever had the chance of doing. And I learned a lot of things in the process. So thank you very much to Linfex and to Professor Petriccione for, for this opportunity. You know, thank you very much, Sura uh, and Amartya. You don't have to thank me. We have, we, we have to thank you yeah, for, for this fantastic introduction to this uh, uh, very new mathematics, at least to, the, to most of us. Yeah, that, uh, um, although we qualify for pensioner discounts, uh, we never were uh, faced with, with these mathematics before. <laughs> so it's, it's really, really, uh, really amazing. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to learn more about it. And, and maybe we need to start planning uh, a follow-up course for next year, maybe. Yeah? And, um, and who knows, maybe we managed to organize uh, uh, still um, something related to this in, in, during the next months. Yeah? But so, Tsura uh, Benamata, thank you so much. It was really very nice, and um, thank you for embracing uh, uh, with such energy the Nitex family. Yeah, thank you very much. That is really very nice, and um, and I invited everybody in the in the chat to join us for a short uh, virtual interaction with you in uh, in the famous Kumo space, so that maybe everybody has the chance in person to uh, to thank you and, and ex exchange maybe some. Uh, uh, some ideas um, <clears throat> for future interactions. Yeah? So thank you very much again to everyone. Uh, we will post, of course, the video on, on, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel uh, as soon as possible. And um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to keep um, learning more about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really very nice. Thank you. Um, Francesco, if I may, I, I, I actually forgot to say one, just one sentence. Is Please. that although we, although we did uh, like very, very basic things, uh, we, we do feel that now uh, the, the audience is very well prepared to start reading uh, books in category theory. <laughs> yes, I think that will be a, a big help because, you know, I told you earlier that uh, because of my interaction with, with Joseph, I bought a book on category theory, but now, now with your help, it will be much easier to read. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you and very also much. Also for Francesca. the audience for their participation. It was lovely. Yeah, no, thank you very much to for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank I you. hope to see most of you in Kumo space just now. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye. Bye bye. All the bye. best. Bye.